Chris Point groups. Both of them at this point have uh, well-defined free signatures. They're not quite merging. They, and in terms of the gate to gate shear magnitude, the normalized rotation, the southern of the two Cobra tornadoes, not the one that's going to hit the community per se, but the one just to the southeast is the strongest in terms of the, the Doppler velocity signatures. And going a few minutes later on, Big Hook has come out, reformed the two debris balls, well showed up now, one that's over and just debris is now falling out north of Gober. One that is with filter number two and an elongated debris signature along that and southwest of that part where debris has been tossed in the air, it's still falling out. And of the two, the radar signature is strongest on the southeast of the two tornadoes. That one was at 18. Uh, three minutes later, took a little bit of a slice. We have debris balls on both of the Pilbur tornadoes, northwest to southeast. A slice across there. There's the debris ball of one of them. There's the northwestern of the two. No, I got that wrong. It's this one and that one. And the two, the vertically, in terms of the debris signature, a pair of them, they go up 10,000 feet high or so in terms of how far up the, the debris is going. Go out a few more minutes, beginning to sort of get a closing off, maybe the roof line down draft totally wrapping around it now, still the two debris ball-like features, still in the upper right, the two separate but beginning to merge debris signatures. And now at this point, uh, two vortex signatures, still the, the southeast one is the strongest of the two when we look at the normalized rotation. Definitely the southeast of the tornadoes is the stronger. Go a couple more minutes, and what you mainly see is that southeastern one with the main debris ball, but still two, the, the, the one that had been southeast of Pilger now has revolved around and has sort of gotten northeast of the, of the number one. So they are doing that, the, the, the first one revolving about the second one, or the two twining about each other. They, they started out northwest, southeast, now they've oriented themselves northeast, southwest, and their debris signatures are, are merging with Pilger that had been to the southeast is now Pilger northeast. The, the one that went right into Pilger is down to the southwest. And uh, so interesting changes going on. A few more minutes uh, later, and now the whole area has lost sort of the debris ball signature, a big elongated line, and massive tornado combined almost circular debris signature. It's four and a quarter nautical miles wide uh, with a couple little or, or maybe three, maybe this is going to be where the triangle is, is going to be that next tornado in the family, number four of the, the tornadoes from this complex. So an interesting day, one of the more interesting days to look at the evolution of, of radar. Uh, one of the deadliest days was the Valonia Mayflower Arkansas Day. A bunch of tornadoes there in Arkansas. And by the way, my, my ranking of 10 for the Little Rock area, this is in 2014, it didn't include that. So once again, we're getting tornadoes in that Little Rock uh, area, Tornado Alley, Mini Tornado Alley. Uh, some nasty damage occurred there. And looking at just as a cursory manner, the the uh, signatures, Bologna is just to the north of Little Rock in, in central Arkansas, morning, well this is actually about right at the bottom of the time, and so there's a warm front that's sitting right in the area with a little bit more southeast winds, but dew, dew point temperatures in the 70s, it's warm enough, it's moist enough, it's just unstable enough to combine with that southeast surface winds to be both unstable and have the most favorable shear. Down in, in uh, Louisiana, it was warm and moist, southerly winds, not as favorable of a wind pattern. At uh, 850 millibars, it's a 50 knot low level jet coming in uh, over the Little Rock area, upper level 500 millibar. The trough is still over West Texas, but if you take a look here at 300 millibars, that trough has some big diffluence. One branch of it comes out over southern Arkansas and Louisiana. Part of it comes up north across the Kansas-Missouri border. And so that pulling apart 
It's like pulling and spreading your hands apart at the top of the bath water. The water will rise up from below. And in this case, the atmosphere rises up from below. That, that fluent signature is one known to be favorable for, for aiding in storm formation. Sort of a proximity sounding a little rock there, right about at the time, uh, shows a, a quite a bit of cape. Uh, a pretty favorable photograph. If we thought the previous Pilgrim case was wild, the supercell composite in this case is 42. So pretty huge values. The storm uh, significant drain parameter 10. And again, we're, we're maybe not pinging the top of the chart, but way above sort of those typical EF4 and, and, and lower tornado <coughs> values that are sort of the climatology of um, the, the sounding values. In fact, we took soundings at Little Rock at 12Z, 18Z, 21, and then zero. Surface base cape dropped from 12Z to 18Z and then shot back up as the day progressed. The helicity pinged out there at 21Z at about 510 reference about 100 is sort of about the minimum. So we're about five times what we needed. Supercell parameters started out pretty minimal, went up to 25, went up to 42 as I showed. A significant tornado parameter kept rising. So interesting evolution taking place there as that warm front crept a little bit to the north. For the most part, the radar in this case is kind of as you'd expect. But as I step through this, I'll go through kind of quickly. Uh, there's a couple of odd things there if you're following radar that uh, uh, maybe we can learn from this. Big book echo, little second arm coming in uh, as the tornado was forming. The uh, Doppler storm relative velocities in the upper right here showing more of mesocyclone signature uh, south and west of that circle. It's back in this little book echo area here. It has some uh, second level rotation, gate to gate shear intensity, and gosh, maybe even at this time there's a little debris signature hole even there, so maybe right from the start in this case, pretty close to the tornado, to the radar, it's seeing the debris signature right on. Stepping ahead a few minutes, it didn't take very long to get a debris ball with it, pretty well defined debris signature, uh, tornado vortex signature, pretty well defined debris signature, all things are just as you expect to see them classic for a radar signature. So what I wanted really to do is to step to this time period. And in this case, the debris ball is still there south and west of Roland, but a velocity, storm relative velocity signature that looks kind of odd. It's, what has happened is that the rotation has got so strong that it is beyond the resolving capability unambiguously of the radar. I don't remember the value, it's probably about 65 knots. Maybe anybody here knows the details, but that means that if the velocity got to be 70 knots, the radar couldn't resolve that, it flops over and reports it as like minus, six, minus 60. And so odd things start happening in terms of the graphical displays when the velocities get faster than what the unambiguous can be resolved by the radar. And some odd things start happening also in terms then of the gate to gate shear, there's a normalized velocity. But the correlation coefficient is different. It doesn't rely on the velocity. It's just that tumbling, what's the nature of what's in the scatterers. And so you continue to get a pretty well-defined debris signature in this case. We'll step ahead. The debris signature, it's headed up toward Mayflower. Still a very odd looking folded velocity pattern and in fact it's so odd that the raw computer algorithms that try to calculate the intensity of the circulation, this normalized gate to gate shear rotation doesn't show anything right where the tornado is. No bullseye at all showing up, but the debris signature is still there. So the point being that when in doubt, if, if things start looking goofy in the velocities, but you've still got a well-defined tornado debris signature in the correlation coefficient. You still have a nasty, destructive tornado in progress, even if, if the velocities maybe are making you go, oh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, in this case, the debris, you're taking a slice through, there's the tornado coming up uh, right about in there. It gets up into the midst of the storm. It's harder to see in detail. 
Uh, I've got the same thing here in the raw return of the radar, but then I have the debris signature. It's coming up these blue values up to about the 7,000 feet or so at this time. Yeah, so where the debris is going. Stepping through just a little bit more. Uh, well, we're back. We're out of the folding. It's hitting Mayflower with a debris ball. It's hitting Mayflower with a debris signature. The velocities are back to more normal, and we've got a normalized rotation yellow bullseye in there. And there's what it looks like. Looking like it's well defined as a tornado up in at least 15,000 feet uh, in this case. And again, uh, looking that same thing, and then with the debris signature. Looks like the debris at least up 10,000 feet, probably into these green values, 12,000 feet or so. And it, just stepping through there, the rest of this is pretty normal. Big bullseye, the debris signature there down at the bottom of the hook where it's wrapping around. You probably see the roof like that. You have gust front coming in there, so this is sort of right at where that roof line diagraph there is coming in from the northwest, heads off to the northeast, and it's like that. It's like the Harlem Globetrotters fan in the basketball. Put the basketball here and fan it with that rear flank downdraft on its saw side. And that's where the tornado is sitting. There, there, and the debris. And a very strong signature showing up with that. Keeps going. Pretty classic. Goes past Bologna. Debris signature getting a little bit more elongated beyond and north of the tornado as it's being shot aloft ahead of the tornado. And uh, unfortunately, this is what the result is. Slabs swept clean of, of all of their uh, former uh, homes. Quickly then dissipated. Got a few minutes left. I wanted to take you to a couple, let's say, to be polite, less classic. <laughs> They're nowhere near classic. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Two of them, if I have time to quickly go through it. One of them. This is not a mistake. I haven't made a typo here. A non-thunderstorm EF2 tornado. And then a long track, non-continuous, quasi-linear convective system tornado. So let's take a look at these if we've got time to, uh, to do that. Well, this is a day with no lightning. Not only no lightning in Valdosta, Georgia, got hit by the tornado, but no lightning anywhere in the country. Uh, you can see, though, this big elongated string bean of a thunderstorm. Well, I, I even have to correct myself. I used to say thunderstorms any time I talk about this string bean of a non thunderstorm. <laughs> this string bean of a thunder of a shower has gotten itself elongated such that it makes you suspect there's some rotation there. And if it didn't know better, you would say, well, that here's the hook, pretty close to Valdosta. And uh, if you look at the velocities, though, you're pretty hard-pressed to see anything that looks too much like a rotation signature. But if you take a look at the correlation coefficient, down in the midst of this, I hate to call it a debris ball, I don't know what it is, but there was a tornado in there, uh, is uh, debris. Notice the uh, Road patterns in there. There's from Valdosta. This is about two miles. This is on the south side of Valdosta, where this, these roads are coming together. That's where that quasi debris signature is, and there is definitely debris <coughs> inside of this whole thing. This low correlation coefficient. That whole triangular thing there has got debris in it. Here's the slice through in terms of the regular return on radar. Not only was the 30 dBZ would be green, so that's sort of a light rain. Not only did that not go up 10,000 feet, but basically the highest place you could find in the whole storm. The whole shower was 15,000 feet tall, and the heavy rain was below 4,000 feet. But gosh, there's a tornado debris signature up to 5,000 feet with this thing. Of course, there was no warning. Uh, well, they, well there, I guess there was once they got reported that it was a tornado in progress, but it was certainly not any expectation ahead of time. This was not trivial. I mean, it knocked down this lumber stuff. This, you know, this was a big, uh, you know, lumber warehouse kind of thing. So never say never. Weird things do happen. Don't pull this pretty is cool one, of the, one of the weirder things. Uh, so weather condition-wise, southern, south central Georgia, it was 
like a five knot wind there. It's relatively moist. Maybe a little bit of a trough in there. The Tallahassee sounding, which is the nearest proximity sounding, just 50 miles or so to the south. That's you don't see that as having I mean, any kind of instability. Uh, 850 millibars. Well, there's a little bit of a 25 knot, 30 knot little level jet that's fanning the area right close to that. The upper level trough is in New Mexico. There's pretty fast winds aloft. There's 75 uh, knot winds over the area, but certainly not the kind of day that raises any kind of red flags in terms of going to have a tornado that hits Valdosta, Georgia. And one more I wanted to show, uh, and this sort of takes back again to whatever you can tell the weather service if you're out there chasing in terms of did the tornado lift and then come back down or was it continuous or whatever. The weather service had some problems on this day. I was covering this real time and uh, what the weather service concluded was that this was a 118 mile long semi-continuous EF2 track. It was a quasi-linear convective system kind of circulation big along the line of thunderstorms. It was some lightning in this. One little little swirly in there. This is right near the Georgia-Alabama border. Not too far away from, that's not Omaha, Nebraska, that's Omaha, Georgia. This is pretty close to Columbus, uh, Georgia. There's a tornado vortex signature in there and that little guy kept going all the way up into the southeast suburbs of Atlanta, weakening at times, strengthening at times. I'm not even sure it was the same circulation, but there was something like this little uh, in the line the whole time. This one may, was maybe near a warm front, mostly just a little bit to the south of it. Uh, and uh, it was sort of mid-afternoon. Let's see. So in the morning, there was a lot of southerly flow in there. By evening, uh, faster southwest winds had kept in any 50 millibars. 500 millibars to start in the morning had a trough in East Texas, which as a short wave came charging uh, toward the area. So this one had a little bit more forcing to it uh, than, uh, than that previous Valdosta, Georgia case that I showed. But it didn't have very much more going for it. Uh, the sounding, again, Tallahassee sounding being the closest one, uh, not very much came to it. A little bit of positive areas. A little bit of a turning photograph there. Morning. This is the 18Z. They took a special sounding. Supercell composite, though, not the 40 that we saw in some of those big cases uh, in the heart of uh, the strong tornadoes, but 4.6 significant tornado parameter, 0.7. And compared to the climatology, some of the cases we looked at that were the big tornado days, the pinging the chart there up at the top. This one is pretty much pinging the chart down where a tornado is not expected in this kind of environment, which, which sort of takes us though as a, as a departure, there's a lot of these skipping track tornadoes reported in the literature, how many are right, how many are wrong, we don't know, if we don't have the detailed information to, to do it, there's a tornado in 1917 reported to be 293 miles long, the Charleston platoon tornado, now Grizzulis, the writer of the big thick book, thinks the longest of them was 45 miles, Tornado family. Uh, the 219, the Tri State tornado, is what it's typically listed as, but some of our colleagues have, have done research and think maybe it's really it was 174 miles. There's some other ones there in Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama that are in the longer than 175, and some 170s. The first one that we really are pretty sure, well, we're pretty sure that the tri-state is at least 174 miles. Sort of the next one kind of confident in is about 160. Then uh, there was one there in 2010, a survey, we know it's 149 miles, Mississippi, 128, et cetera. But this 118 mile skipping movement would be pretty long and sort of in a pretty unusual quasi-linear convective system kind of configuration. So. Just stepping through this one, no doubt it had, at times, there's a zoom in of that little kink in the line, has the tornado vortex signature in the velocity, the normalized rotation, the gate-to-gate -gate shear, it definitely shows up as an enhanced bullseye, 
And it's got a little tornado debris signature with it. Not very tall though. And they can slice through. It's up 10. Well, uh, this whole storm as a whole is higher than that, but it's not much bigger than 30,000 feet tall. And very, very tilted. Look how it, uh, even with some exaggeration by the, by the scanning process, this one was really tilted. I just skipped through these, sort of just looking at the upper left here. It sort of starts getting elongated out and then really gets kind of decoupled. Uh, but still, it's either carrying debris with it or, or making new debris at, at times all along that 118 mile path. Really gets sort of discombobulated here. The velocities don't show too much, you would think, except maybe there's another little kink that's formed in there briefly, a little bit of a stronger rotation source. So, like I say, I'm not sure it's exactly the same circulation or a new ones that form, but something in that uh, went on for a long time. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll end. I hope you've uh, learned something. I hope you've enjoyed that. And happy Valentine's Day. I'll just